Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our fifth midweek service during this season of Lent as we continue making our way to Good Friday, to the cross and the empty tomb, and we continue with our theme this evening of being exiles with those in Babylon and singing with them the goodness of our Lord. Um, Tonight, we also thank the, the cemetery board for a wonderful supper. It was delicious. And we only have one more week of midweek services left. It's hard to believe. So anyway, as we begin our worship this evening, we sing our opening hymn, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed. Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing praise to your name, O Most High. To herald your love in the morning. Your truth at the close of the day. And now let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you pardon. Dear friends, the Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. Please be seated. 
a reading from the Passion History of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for this fifth midweek service, Jesus Before Pilate. When the Jewish leaders had bound Jesus, they led him from Caiaphas to the palace of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, the only person who had the power to put someone to death. But they refused to go into Pilate's palace. He was a Gentile, and they wanted to keep themselves ceremonially clean so that they could join in eating the Passover meal that afternoon. So Pilate came out, and he asked them, What charge do you bring against this man? If he weren't a criminal, they answered, we, would have, we wouldn't have brought him here for you to judge. Take him then and judge him by your law, Pilate told them. But the Jews objected. Your government doesn't allow us to put anyone to death. They said this so that what Jesus had told his followers earlier about the way he was going to die would come true. Pilate then asked them what Jesus had done to deserve the death penalty. Knowing they could not tell Pilate that Jesus was guilty of a religious matter like blasphemy, the Jewish leaders started to accuse him of things that were crimes against Roman law. They said, we have evidence that proves this man has been stirring up trouble among our people. He has been telling them not to pay their taxes to your government. And besides that, he claims that he is the Messiah, their king. Pilate went back inside the palace and had his men bring Jesus before him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked him. Is that your idea, Jesus asked, or did others tell you about me? I'm certainly not a Jew, am I, Pilate replied. Your own people and the chief priests have turned you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, my kingdom is not like the kingdom of the world. If it were, then my subjects would have fought, me, fought to keep me out of the hands of my Jewish enemies. But my kingdom is not of this world. You are a king then, Pilate asked quickly. Jesus answered him, you are right in saying that I am a king. I was born and I came into the world for one reason, for one purpose, to bring truth to the world. Everything and everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. What is truth, Pilate sneered. Without waiting for an answer, he went back out to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in this man. He has done nothing to deserve death. But the chief priests and the elders were not ready to give up. They kept on pressing their charges even more vehemently, talking louder and louder, raising one accusation after another against Jesus. He's stirring up the people all over Judea to turn against your government. That's what he's been teaching them. He started out in Galilee, and now he's come all the way down here to Jerusalem. On hearing this, Pilate asked Jesus, if he was a Galilean, or asked if Jesus was a Galilean, excuse me. When he learned that Jesus belonged under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod so that Herod could decide his case. Fortunately, Herod was in Jerusalem at the time. Herod was very glad to see Jesus. He had heard a lot about him and hoped that this would give him a chance to see Jesus perform a miracle. Herod asked Jesus one question after another. But Jesus didn't answer him, nor did he perform any miracles. All the while, the chief priests and other Jewish leaders were standing there, vehemently accusing Jesus. Herod then allowed his soldiers to mock and ridicule Jesus. They dressed him in a gorgeous robe, such as kings wear, and pretended to honor him as a king. Then Herod sent Jesus back to Pilate. On that day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before that... They had been enemies. Pilate then called the Jewish leaders and the people together once again and told them, You brought this man to me. You accused him of trying to get the people to turn against my government. But I have examined him right here before your eyes. I don't find him guilty of a single one of the crimes you accuse him of. Nor did Herod, because he sent him back to us. So it's perfectly clear he's done nothing for which he should be sentenced to death. I will have him punished and then release him. Now at the Passover festival, it was the governor's custom to set one prisoner free, one the people chose. 
It's a way of winning favor with the Jews. This particular year, he had a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. Barabbas was behind bars for starting a riot, as well as for murder. Pilate knew full well that Jesus was innocent, and the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him because they were jealous of him. So he said to the crowd, It's customary for me to release one prisoner during the Passover. Now which one do you want me to set free for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? The chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to kill Jesus. Pilate asked them again, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? The people screamed out as with one voice, Away with this man! Release for us Barabbas. While Pilate was sitting in the judgment seat, he received the message from his wife. That man is innocent. He hasn't done anything wrong. Don't, believe, don't have anything to do with him, for I have suffered much over him today in a dream. Then Pilate turned to the crowd once again and said, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? Crucify him, they all shouted. Crucify him. Crucify him. But Pilate still wanted to set Jesus free. So he took Jesus and had him whipped until his back was torn and bloody. He had the entire regiment of his soldiers gather around Jesus and mock him. The soldiers took off his clothes and made him wear a purple robe. Then they twisted some thorn branches together into the shape of a crown and jammed it down on his head and put a stick for a scepter in his right hand. Then one by one they got down on their knees in front of Jesus and said, Hail, King of the Jews. Pilate went outside again and said to the Jews, Now I am going to bring Jesus out to you so that you will know that I don't find him guilty of any crime at all. So Jesus came out still wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to the crowd, Behold the man. But when the chief priests and their officials saw Jesus, they began to chant, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate told them, You take him and crucify him then, because I don't find him guilty. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. Once again, he took Jesus back into the palace. Where do you come from? he asked. But Jesus wouldn't answer. This angered Pilate. He growled and said, Do you refuse to answer me? Don't you know I have the power to crucify you or to release you? Jesus answered him, You wouldn't have any power at all over me if God hadn't given it to you. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Overwhelmed at Jesus' answers, Pilate kept on trying to find some way to set him free. But the Jews kept shouting, if you set this man free, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king has set himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the stone pavement, or in Aramaic, Gabbatha. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they shouted fiercely, Take him away! Take him away and crucify him! Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Pilate saw he was getting nowhere, and he realized the whole situation might set off a riot. So he took water, washed his hands for everyone to see, and said, I will not take blame for killing this good man. This man's death is on your heads. Then all the people responded, let this blood let his blood be on us and our children. Then Pilate, bowing to the pressure and wishing to satisfy the crowd, gave in to their demands. He released Barabbas and had Jesus flogged. He then surrendered Jesus to their will to be crucified. The soldiers of the governor took off the purple robe and put his own clothes back on him. They then led him out to crucify him. A reading from the Passion History of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now our Old Testament reading for this evening, keeping with our theme for this year from Isaiah 48, verses 17 through 22. 
Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like waves of the sea. Your offspring would have been like sand and your descendants like, like its grains. Their name would never be cut off or destroyed from before me. Go out from Babylon, free from Chaldea. Declare this with a shout of joy. Proclaim it. Send it out to the end of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and the water gushed out. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle for this evening is from Hebrews chapter 9. When Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then, the, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. This too is the word of the Lord. We rise for the gospel. The holy gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs in your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men... I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands I commend my spirit. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated as we sing our sermon hymn together, 431, Not All the Blood of the Beast. <clears throat>
Dear friends, this evening and always, grace, peace, and mercy be yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening comes from Isaiah chapter 48, verses, verse 20. Go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea, declare this with a shout of joy, proclaim it, send it out to the end of the earth. If any of these situations that are encountered in life happened, we would have two words immediately on our lips that we would all in unison shout out if we or loved ones were in this situation. For example, car turns over in a ditch off the interstate. Two young children are trapped in it. The mother is thrown out of the car. She's unconscious, but the kids are inside. It starts on fire. It's burning as people, bystanders, come by, rush to get down to the car to help the children. You can hear it. We shout with them, get out. Get out of the car. Get them out of the car. They must get out of the car. Or how about a situation where a young man or young woman is involved in a relationship that's abusive. Their parents see it. Their friends see it. It's a terrible situation. The people that love the young person that's engaged in that relationship see how destructive it is. And two words come to their mind out of love for this person in their life. Get out. Get out of that relationship. Or something maybe more common, maybe not quite as serious, but still something that makes you long to help people you love. You have a son or daughter that's trained hard for what they want to do with their life, and they end up in a dead-end job, a dead-end job where they're simply not appreciated, and they work for a difficult boss. No matter how hard they try and work and accomplish, there's no doors that seem to open for advancement or doing better or recognition for their efforts. And loving them, your heart cries out to them, get out, get out of that dead-end job. Get out, those are the words of our loving Lord for his people for this evening, in our text for this evening. Get out. The message he has for his dear people 500 plus years before Jesus came to the earth as our Savior, to his people that were in Babylon, he cries to them, get out of Babylon. Leave this place. Get out and declare to the world, to everyone, that the Lord your God has redeemed his dear child Jacob. We know while, why they're there. Our whole Lenten series this year has been about why Jacob, Israel, God's people, are in exile in Babylon. We've talked about this now for five weeks together. God, out of love for his people who had turned against him, who had rebelled against him, who had chased after foreign gods and foreign practices, was no longer listening to his word by and large. God, out of love for them, raised up the pagan king Nicodemus and used Nicodemus to carry his dearly beloved child, Jacob, his children, into Babylon, into captivity, to get their attention, to wake them up, to remind them they belong to him, and that he loves them, and they must remember his words and his promises to them to awaken the remnant to those who would turn back to him. And he did that. Throughout this series this year, we've heard about how God loved his people. Everything he did was done out of love for them, 
and toward the purpose of keeping his promise that he made through them to bring the Messiah into the world. We heard how God marked them. He called them his own. He told them how much he loved them. And then last week we heard how God raised up a second pagan ruler, the God of the universe who's in control of everything, the God of the universe that even controls men who thought they were the most powerful men on earth at the time, he raised up a second pagan named Cyrus the Great to let his people go, to break down those great walls, those great doors of Babylon, to open them up and to show his people that his promise to set them free had come true. They were free to start returning to their homeland, the promised land, to Jerusalem, to Judah, to the place they had been taken from. But most of them didn't go. They didn't. And so God here in our text for this evening is crying out to his people that he has freed, that he has done everything for, get out. Get out of Babylon. Leave Chaldea. I've done all this for you. Leave and proclaim to the world that the God of Jacob has set his children free. Tell them what I have done. Get out. But sometimes getting out of difficult situation, difficult situations is easier said than done, isn't it? Like those three examples I started with this evening. Get out of the car, kids. Please get out of the car. Your heart yearns for that. You imagine the situation. You think of those kids in that terrible situation. But yet getting out of the car is harder than it sounds. If the car's turned on its side, if the doors are blocked, if the fire's spreading throughout, if there's no way to break windows, if there's no way to free them from their seatbelts, any number of things seemingly make those obvious words get out complicated. Or in the situation where you have the young person engaged in or involved in an abusive relationship, it seems so obvious. Get out. Get out of it. Get away from the man who's abusing you or the woman who's abusing you. Get away from that. It seems so easy, but it's complicated. As a lawyer who practiced for 10 years, I saw countless domestic issues. It's amazing how abused people stay in abusive relationships for countless reasons. It's hard to understand. Often, the person abused actually loves the abuser. Sometimes they feel like they have no place to go. What do they do? They have no money. Sometimes control's an issue. It's complicated, so we cry, get out, but they don't go. Or the child that's stuck in the dead-end job. Why? Why do you keep working there? Why do you keep dealing with the abuse and, and the difficulty and the the never-ending struggles that aren't leading you anywhere. You work so hard. You do such a good job. Get out and go get a better job. But it's complicated, isn't it? It's complicated. Where do I go, Dad? I don't have any other options. No job openings. I've been looking. I've got school loans. I've got a house loan, a mortgage. I've got a car loan. I've got a wife and kids to support. Where am I supposed to go? I want to get out, but I can't. You see, getting out, it seems so easy sometimes, but because we live in a fallen world, it becomes very, very complicated. God had achieved everything he intended to achieve through his people and with his people in the Babylonian captivity. We've seen that over the course of the last several weeks. He had now set them free and was saying, get out. But it became complicated. You see, we know from history and from Scripture, some people got assimilated to living in Babylon. 
They actually started to like living in Babylon. They actually started to get accustomed to the false religions and false ways of looking at things. The false gods of Babylon. We heard before a couple weeks ago how actually many of them had their names changed on purpose by the Babylonians. To make them fit in more. To make them feel as if they're part of that community. We also know that if you were one that went along to get along in Babylon, financially you did quite well. So many of these Jews who were in exile, if they played the game, if they blended in, if they became like the people that had brought them into captivity, they were doing really, really well. So God cries, get out, get out, but it's complicated. Have you guys heard of that metaphor, that syndrome of the frog in the boiling water? You guys know how that goes, right? They say, according to that analogy or metaphor, that illustration, if you boil a pan of water and stick a frog in it, they will jump out because the water's hot and boiling. But you know how it goes, right? What happens if you put a frog in tepid water, lukewarm water, let it get comfortable for a while, and then just start turning the heat up to boiling? The frog won't jump out and will die. This was happening to the people in Babylon, to God's people, Jacob, the people God had made a promise to that belonged to him, his dear people, the people most significantly that he was using to keep his promise to the whole world of sending the Messiah through them, through his people, many of them were enjoying their little bath in the ever, ever boiling water of Babylon. And it probably went something like this. Yeah, the gates are open, but you know, we sort of like our new neighborhood. The kids like going to school with those other kids, those, those pagan kids. You know, it, it seems like those heathen people that believe in those false gods, they're pretty nice people. Yeah, they're pretty good people. We get along with them. They bring us casseroles on Wednesdays, and they seem to be good neighbors. And you know what? We've got that pretty good job down at the bank. I hate to rock the boat. That job pays pretty good. And sure, we have to make sacrifices to that false god, but life's pretty good here. We sort of like our situation. And the kids start crying, what do you mean leave? All my friends are here. All my friends that I play with all the time, my best friend, you're going to take me out of this? You're going to take me back to this stinky place I've never heard of before? And then moving... Have you ever moved? I'm sure all of you have. Moving's not much fun. Carrie and I moved <laughs> all our stuff to come here. I did all that in about a month and a half, and that was minor. Imagine packing up everything for your huge family to move back from Babylon, from your nice place, your comfortable home if you played along to get along, from all your pagan friends that you've sort of started to like hanging out with, from your cushy job, from your nice neighborhood, from your kids' friends, packing up everything and going back to a place your kids have never seen and a place you don't even remember. That water got hot in a hurry. It started to boil in a hurry. But God's message in our text for this evening, his message to his people is, get out. Get out of Babylon. Listen to me. Get out. I've done all this for you. It's all ready. Get out. Leave. Leave and go back home and tell everyone what I have done for you. This message from almost 2,600 years ago, this message of God warning and telling his people his dear children who are oblivious to the water starting to boil around them, this message of get out, get out, leave, go home, listen to me, I have freed you, is just as applicable 
to his dear little frog children today because the same problems arise today. The same issues come up. We live in a world in exile most of the time. We find ourselves in exile for countless reasons that we've talked about over these last five weeks. Our sin gets us into exile. Other people's sin gets us into exile. Living in the fallen world makes us feel as if we're in exile. And our Lord is crying out to us, get out. I've freed you. It's what the season of Lent is all about. This perfect, perfect fit together of what we hear about in our text of God bringing his people into exile to save them, saving them and now telling them to get out. It's what the season of Lent is all about for us as God's people today. Lent is a season of exile for us. A season of being in the wilderness with our Lord. A season of remembering who we are and how much God loves us. And a season of being brought home at the end of it by our loving God. Remember the lessons of Babylon. Remember how easy it is to not want to leave that place of exile that's so dangerous. To start hearing the same things like, I know what God says in his word, but that doesn't make any sense today. We're like the only people that think that, mom and dad. If we hold to that and do that, we're weirdos. I know what God says about marriage, but we know countless people that don't follow that and they sure seem to love each other just fine. And they're wonderful neighbors. And what if we start talking about that stuff at work? Is that going to affect my job? Is that going to affect the way people in the neighborhood see me? Are my kids going to get ostracized at school because they listen to God's word and they listen to the Lord telling them to get out? This text, like all of Scripture, it tells the message for God's people 2,600 years ago or whenever it was written, and originally original text, and it tells the same message to God's people today because the same problems plague us today that plagued God's people all those years ago. Out of love for us, as we make our way through this exile, this wilderness of Lent, God reminds us, I kept my promise. I did it all for you. I sent the one I promised all the way back in the garden. He came. He came to not only set you free from exile in a foreign country, he came to set you free from exile that was keeping you separated from me. He came to redeem you and reconcile you and love you. So hear this message tonight. Hear the Lord out of love telling you in whatever exile you find yourself in life, and you will time and time again, get out. Get out of Babylon. I forgive you. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We now receive the offering.
we rise for prayer. As we pray the litany this evening, we pray for Eric and Barb and Jeff and Pastor Zeman and Marcus and Jeanette and Dee Dee and Holly and Mark and Tom, Tim, Robert, Wayne, Nicole, and all those we name before our Lord in our hearts. And we pray together, O oh Lord, have mercy. O oh Christ, have mercy. O oh Lord, have mercy. O oh Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us, God bless you, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death. The Lord's by the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Amen. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, Amen. we poor sinners implore you. To rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to sustain them in holy living, to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. We you to hear us, good Lord. To raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand. To comfort and help the weak-hearted and distressed. We you to hear us, good Lord. To give to all people concord and peace. To preserve our land from discord and strife. To give our country your protection in every time of need to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, to watch over and to help all who are in danger and necessity and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessing, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage, and to have mercy on us all. We pray to hear us, good Lord. To forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts, to give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. We pray to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we are glory Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Mighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn, 550, Lamb of God. Again, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming as we make our journey together through Lent. Thanks again to the cemetery board for a delicious supper. Next week, as I mentioned earlier, it's our last midweek service, Wednesday service for Lent. Uh, we'll finish up talking about, we won't finish up because we're going to continue our series through Easter, but we'll, we'll finish up our Wednesday part of it. And then I think the men's group is going to make soup, chili, meal, something like that for next week. We'll talk about it on Saturday. We'll have something good for you, okay? 
So come and join us for that. Any announcements before we go? Okay, well, drive safe going home. God bless everybody. Have a wonderful evening.